Um, the next person we have is Rob. Who have you gone, Rob? Okay, it's just it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rob. So, Rob Small. Um, the first time I met Rob Small was when he actually came and talked to our Park Sport and Recreation Group at um, um, the Vodacom Warriors out in Ericsson Stadium. And speaking in a room of I don't know, 120, 130 park specialists, Rob had everybody's attention. From my perspective, he's probably one of the leaders that we've got in our industry here in New Zealand. He does a great amount of work with a whole range of different people. Um, you know, specifically some of the stuff here, Rob was saying that, you know, this is one of the buildings that he's presented in over time. So Rob worked with the ARC, has had 45 years experience in the industry, is a qualified landscape architect, um, and brings an awful lot to us. Today, so I really, really do appreciate Rob and Jess coming from Nati Fatu Araki. It's great that we we also need to recognise that, as Rob talks about, the, the people that are the kaitiaki tangata of the land. You know, Mana Whenua is really the people that we need to work with and understand how they've worked with the land because they've been here for about 600 years or more. Seven. So really, really important. And to be fair, when you go to Auckland Museum and you see the craft that they sailed here from Hawiki, you've got to have some really, really big kahunas to even get in something like that and come across the South Pacific, to be fair. So from a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Celt, so I'm Welsh. I, I, I you know, originate from South Wales. My entire family history, we're all Celts. We dislike the English with a passion, I'm sorry to say. We love it when we beat them in, in rugby. That is our, our mecca, is when Wales can beat England in rugby. And I guess from another perspective, you know, the Mana Whenua here in New Zealand, they cherish the land. They cherish their culture, they cherish their society. And I think we all have a responsibility to embrace that. So, I'll pass over to Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Ko nga taki makafauru e taku waka ko uh, whakatiri manawa kaiai a taku maunga ko uh, <coughs> haukianga nui a kupe taku moana ko moi hau taku awa. Ko tuhirangi te marae, ko nāpui tutu mahu i mili a hau, ko Rob Small a hau. So I'm a, uh, of northern uh, Maori descent. Uh, but I've had the pleasure in the last uh, five years, really, of working with Ngāti Whātua on a couple of propositions. One is an independent director on their Whai Maia board, which is their active working board, and uh, I, I'm just in awe of what they're achieving. So every member who, of Ngāti Whātua who can uri, who has a descent back to Tupariri, who's the primary um, uh, I suppose uh, rangatira of that group uh, gets absolutely free health insurance, just as an example of what they've been able to achieve for the people. But what I want to talk about today, I hope we'll, you'll see as well, but I want to talk about um, the development of this, what I call the Māori Ethnobotanic Garden. In actual fact, what it is, um, is the development of a garden um, for Ngāti Whātua Ōrake, with Ngāti Whātua Ōrake, and by a Māori practitioner. So, um, I'll that. Um, uh, so I, I started on a piece of work for them, which was to look at uh, how I would develop a garden that met their purposes. And so the, the real research question is, how can Mātauranga Māori guide the development of a contemporary multi-purpose garden for Ngāti Whātua Ōrake? Now I need to, under, uh, to explain what Mātauranga is. Mātauranga is a relatively complex uh, concept, but by and large it, it, um, it considers the law, uh, L-O-R-E, and the, and the uh, tikanga and the history that's been passed down from generation to generation 
through, um, through oratory. Uh, we call it uh, Te Taonga e Tuku or Te Kōrero e Tuku, which is these treasures that were handed down from generation to generation when there was no written word. So they had to be told absolutely faithfully. Uh, and, and in those days, the Māori school was um, Te Whare Wairanga, where people uh, went <coughs> and were actually sorted out as a future tohanga, as a future kāva, as a future uh, um, rongoa. So they were, they were sorted out and from the age of, very young age, they sat with the, the expert, the rangatira in that area and they learnt all of those charts and those things. So mātauranga is a way of telling us why Māori did things in the past. And so my real mission today is to talk to you about how the Māori world, te ao Māori, differs to te ao whānui, the wider world view. So, um, I'll skip that. Um, but, but really the methodology was a thing called kaupapa Māori rangahau, and it gets to the heart of what I'm saying today, which was many of the stories that have been told by Europeans about our ancestors, about Māori in general, uh, are um, grossly inaccurate. And so this methodology or ontology of um, using kaupapa Māori rangahau emerged in the last 20 years and is really about making sure that the Māori story is told from the Māori point of view and is more accurate. For instance, um, uh, I think it's widely held throughout the world because of our haka mainly, uh, but also exaggerated stories that the Māori were savages, that they were warlike people. Uh, and so once we're warriors, certainly didn't do that cause any good. We should say, in Tamaki Makoto at least, once we're gardeners, once we're poets, once we're lovers, take it whatever you like. But they were not warring all the time, any more than the Celts were warring with different people, any more than the uh, different factions in China, for instance, would have been fighting each other at different times. So um, it was really an attempt to tell more accurate stories from a Maori point of view. And the most important thing is that, that um, Maori groups today, as they become more empowered, have a, a strong set of values. And they're about chieftainship, about hosting well, about equal rights, about everybody being together, about being a good steward, about family, about our place where we stand, and about uh, understanding the spirit world. So that's the Oraki land as it stands today. Um, and so you'll notice this piece here is Kawarau Amaki. And once we get past um, the, uh, the uh, Tamaki estuary, uh, our, our borders change. And this is the piece of land I'm talking about up there. Just go back one. Yeah. Just talk quite a few months on that. Um, this area up here is where the Marae is now, what some people would know as Bastion Point, but what we know as uh, Whenua Rangatira or Takaparapau. Uh, this land here is uh, Aukahu Bay, and the land I'm talking about is through here, and more specifically in that area. So these pieces of land, uh, and that's uh, Kepa Road running along the top. Uh, this is um, this is uh, the Oraki Basin, so you get an idea of where the land is. And the land we're concerned about <coughs> is in this area. So, Ngāti Whātua Orake indicated that they, they wanted to 
build a garden, but a garden that served their purposes. And um, in my career, I've been uh, preoccupied with botanic gardens. In fact, uh, this botanic garden here was once part of the department that I led, and uh, that's probably why I've made a lot of, uh, given a lot of discussions here. So we, um, we set out to do something which I saw as being an ethnobotanic garden, the way that Māori people, our tūpuna, used the lands, used the plants for their purposes, whether it was from the forest to Wānui or Tāne, whether it was uh, the region of Homia Tikitiki within uh, that who was the, uh, who was the god of um, wild foods, or indeed whether, whether it was um, in the realm of uh, Rongo, who was um, really the art were involved with gardening. So my brief was to develop in this area a, uh, a vegetable garden for the community, to feed the community. Uh, to develop this nursery, which is, um, both these pieces have been completed, and then to develop some beds for um, wellness. So these are the plants which were used by our tupuna for healing, and they were considerable. If, if we come just to the early 1900s, um, the government of the day passed a Tohunga Suppression Act, uh, 1909. And the object of that was to outlaw the use of Māori medicine, which had proven itself over 700 years. And uh, they wanted to end that witchcraft. You know, in life, there are always these vested interests that come along and disturb things. We've been talking about them today, they're the developer. Uh, in this case, I would suspect it was those medical practitioners of the day and a, and, a, and a European world that thought that if it hadn't been done by them, it wasn't done the right way. So uh, the, the wellness garden, or Mararongwa, is something that we're about to start on at the moment. So this was the idea of the uh, Marakai, and this is where I just want to talk about this Māori point of view. Um, I designed this bed in a round shape because it talks about energy. In fact, there's a well-known principle which goes back uh, several hundred years called the Genesa Principle, uh, which is used by gemologists, but there was a, a um, actually a surveyor in the US, we developed the idea of circle gardening and the energy that it created. So I wanted to create that. I wanted to create paths that went through north, south and east, west. Um, and I also wanted to create an understanding when you walk into this garden, this is unique. It's different. So what are the Maori principles around that? It all comes down to very much how they knew when to do things. And in this time of uh, Matariki, it's probably a very good time to explain what that means. So in the middle of the garden, it's not there yet, is uh, a pillar about so high, which has a disc on it. And that disc has uh, the 30 houses of Maramataka, of the moon cycle. So they're listed around there, and the energies and lack of energies that they have at different times are associated with that. Um, we have been talking about putting a Gregorian calendar on there so we can turn it to the particular day and we can use that to educate. But what does that tell us? It tells us the days of the month. The path that runs east-west, particularly looking towards the east, tells us what month it is. Because it's a funny thing, but the sun arrives, arises in midsummer way to the southeast, and when it's finished about now, you'll notice it's come right around to the northeast. Why does it do that? Well, Tapanui Tira, the sun, has two wives. There's more trouble than most blokes can handle. But anyway, uh, so um, uh, Tapanui Tira heads off in summer to spend the summer with his summer wife, and in winter he heads off. So that tells us the month where that sun rises. And the final thing that is part of this triumvirate of things is when Matariki comes up, we know that's the beginning of a new year. 
and then every so often in the Maori calendar there are 13 months, simply because they work on a 30-day cycle. So um, it was really important for Maori people to be able to observe the world around them and to be able to understand what was the time to plant, what was the time to prune, what was the time to uh, get mullet, what was the time to get nice fat kereru or kukupa as we call them in this part of the world. So they knew all of those things by the tohu, by the signs they saw around them and by this compass. And so this garden is designed to demonstrate that as well as the importance of a number of other things uh, too. And that's uh, just a bit of a look at what the Maramataka compass might look like. Although in my discussion with some of the uh, rangatira we're now talking about potentially um, taking the Gregorian calendar out but putting in there um, a number of indicators towards their key maunga. So maunga kia kia, maunga whau, maunga rei, uh, ohini rangi. And uh, then placing down the side of the plinth the rocks that come from that mountain. This increases in their mind the energy. Next. Uh, so this is a bit of a look at the circle in the garden as it's been developed. And you'll see uh, that shape, no compass there yet. Uh, but um, that garden produced for our people uh, over 2,500 kilograms of food this last summer and about 2,500 uh, tonne of pūra. This is a watercress bed here. Um, and so the whole idea of this garden is we're providing food for the whānau, but ultimately we want them to be able to feed themselves. So uh, we have a, um, an agenda which is about um, giving them good recipes with the, with, that goes with the food we provide, but also potentially um, setting up their own gardens in their, in their own homes. Next. gives you a bit of a look at it, um, and that's part of our firmware crop. Next. So this is uh, the other area, and it involves, um, as I said, uh, basically the wellness garden, but also the weavers garden. So we'll have, um, uh, thanks to, to Jack Hobbs here at the gardens, we'll have about 52 varieties of harakete, but also in that bed for the weavers, we'll have the trees and the plants that were used for uh, the various dyes. And a lot of, a lot of them um, are extremely effective. And then the wellness garden is arranged according to the parts of the tinana, the parts of the body that are treated in this way. So um, you can see antiseptics and burns, tonics, um, uh, digestive system, and so forth, skins, nervous system. Next. Uh, that's just a representative of a traditional pre-colonial um, Kumara garden that we want to build as part of the project. Uh, and based very much, if you've been to Hamilton Gardens, on Te Parapara, which is the garden that Wura Wapuki and his father had a lot to do with. Next. So, um, I just want to talk briefly about what all that means. I think, first of all, um, I think the understanding the spirituality of these things is a really important part. And the way it was, uh, the way I've learned about it from some of my others is if you want to do any of these things in the forest, you should seek permission. So that is a question of having somebody do a karakia and seek permission to remove a large tree from Tane or, uh, or any other deity that's appropriate. But I guess the important thing is to understand this Māori world and the Māori world view as you, uh, as you, as you work with Māori iwi, uh, hapu and whānau because uh, more and more, they're becoming a real force within uh, New Zealand 
economically, socially, and culturally. Uh, Thank you very much, Rob, um, Mel's, Jess, and Stacy, um, for your time today. Um, I'd just like to pass over to the current NZR president, Jaden, who'd just like to say a few words. Thank you. <coughs> um, so this is just a uh, thank you from NZR to you actually, Hal. Um, a lot of your time has gone into this, your own personal time, and um, we really appreciate that. So thank you on our behalf. Anybody have any questions, any comments? Um, what we will do with the presentations is that we'll save them and put them up on NZR's website. Um, it'll be open access, so hopefully you can all get to have a look at them. Um, encourage you, if you can, to take one of these away with you. If you have any children or grandchildren, please take one. Um, and any other information, obviously, um, you can get in touch with myself through Auckland Council. Um, it's howell.davies at aucklandcouncil.govt.nz. Um, and happy enough to try and answer and help with any questions that you might have in terms of uh, obviously the work that we do in-house in from an urban forest strategy perspective um, and also from NZR if there's uh, something that we can do to help. Um, certainly if you are a contractor, I would encourage you, if you're not a member, to please think about joining. Um, there is quite a bit to offer. We have a good conference every year. Um, we have an approved contractor scheme. As Jaden says, we're looking at trying to, um, you know, I guess provide a wider um, ability for arborists to join, as you point out, Mel. We do set the bar quite high, but I guess one of the reasons is we set the bar quite high because we want our industry to be the leaders. And so we want to be known as you know tree care professionals. I think that's a really important thing that for those of us that work in the industry, we have to keep keep that message going out there. We're not just tree climbers. We're not tree hackers. We're not tree stackers. All that stuff. We actually are tree care professionals. And that's a really, really important thing that we need to be telling people. And that's why we encourage people to get qualified, um, you know, to go through the training. All of those things are really important. Obviously, health and safety is really important. But you need to understand trees and have a knowledge of trees. You know, people like Alex Shigo talked about touching trees. This building is a tree. That's why it's cracking all the time. You know, it's just the heat that's moving things around. So, um, would encourage you, if you're not within the industry, would encourage you to point your friends, if you're asking for somebody that needs tree work done, point them to a professional arborist, make sure they're qualified, make sure they're insured. Even better if they're an NZR approved contractor, even better if they're an NZR member. So those are all really important things. Um, I guess from a perspective of, of what Mel's has talked to us about today, to tree care and you know tree protection going forward, we all need to be thinking about those dates that Mel's have talked about. So the next couple of months, July, August, please keep an eye on the press. Please keep an eye on newsletters coming out from Tree Council and from NZR around making this submission. Because everybody in this room, as well as all of your friends, your children, your grandchildren, your dog, your cat, your goldfish, you all need to get somebody to fill in a form and make a submission to the government because we need to change things. We all agree that. Everybody's nodding their heads in the room, and there's lots of other people out there that are nodding their heads as well. So I can just encourage you to talk to those people, help them make a submission. It's not that difficult. If you know, I'm sure we will come up with a submission form that people can fill in. So the more people that can get involved, please encourage everybody that you can to do that. So um, can I just say yeah, sure, please um, do. I don't want you to feel like um, it's the tree council dictating about what your industry wants in terms of the submission <coughs> process. We don't like we don't run your organisations, but we can help facilitate getting these high level rules in place. So if we can have a two way dialogue about what it is that you think that you need in terms of the rules and what you don't need in terms of the rules and that would really help us when we're crafting these guidelines for submission. The last thing we want is to put up a load of stuff and you go, oh no, that's not going to work for us. That's too late. Okay? I need to know now what it is that would work for your industry in terms of the 
what we need to get into this legislation. Okay? So I think if you've got ideas in terms of that, send it to me. Like, it doesn't matter if it's too detailed, that's fine. I can deal with detail. Um, but yeah, it's so talk to us is a two-way well. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's really important that um, people have the same voice because we saw the recent submission that uh, there was one particular industry that submitted on the road situation and there was mixed opinions in that industry that just about through all of that was out. So yeah, yeah um, the more we're singing the same song, the great and the we know that it's been singing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important for us all to realise as well that if you are a practising arborist, if we cut all the trees down, we've got nothing to work on. There's a really, really, a lot of people might miss that fact, but today, you know, co companies like Jaden's in um, Franklin Trees, companies like Treescape, you know, they remove massive amounts of trees, and that's their job, that's what they're employed to do, but remembering that if we cut them all down, we will not have jobs to look after our trees going forward. So it's really important that we think about one tree preservation, and also encourage you all to think about going out and tree planting. We, we plant hundreds of thousands of trees a year in our, in our local and regional parks, encourage you all to think about coming along for the day, a couple of hours digging holes, planting trees with other people, fantastic. The last one I went to in um, Hoskins Reserve in Albany, we have a, a, had a, a group called, turn up called the Green Machine. There are a bunch of Indians from South Auckland that come in, the, in literally what looks like cricket whites, but in the khaki colours, with their name on the back, their number, and they're proud as punch to be there digging holes, planting trees. They travel the country. They go to airports and take spades on planes to go and help people. But remembering that if we cut them all down, we will not have jobs to look after our trees going forward. So it's really important that we think about one tree preservation, and also encourage you all to think about going out and tree planting. We, we plant hundreds of thousands of trees a year in our, in our local and regional parks. We encourage you all to think about coming along for the day, a couple of hours digging holes, planting trees with other people, fantastic. The last one I went to in um, Hoskins Zoo in Albany, we have a, a, had a, a group called, turn up called the Green Machine. There are a bunch of Indians from South Auckland that come in, the, in literally what looks like cricket whites, but in the khaki colours, with their name on the back, their number, and their proud as punch to be there digging holes, planting trees. They travel the country. They go to airports and take spades on planes to go and help people. So I just encourage you all to think about those people and think about the bit that you yourselves can make. You know, Nati Pato Araki has planting days up at Fenua Rangatira. Really important to go there and help them restore the Fenua, because what they're doing in there is absolutely awesome. What you see that's going on there, the work that's happening, really we should all you know, applaud them, because they really are turning the land back into a forest and they really are looking at working with the land rather than pulverizing and beating it up. That's a really important thing for us to take, to take out here today. So thank you very much. Um, if there's any kind left, please grab something on the way out. Please grab a magazine. Um, and we will hopefully be in touch and see you all again at some point. Um, the question is, what uh, information we got today, maybe you could show the part on our label. Tell them about how important the trees are. What if you don't know? You tell them the trees, we need the trees, but the trees don't need us. There's a lot of, of action sold. You are not the first thing to clear the trees. That's the shame. So also, it's a shame we don't see much advertising about the bonds of the trees. That's on the TV and the media. I haven't seen that in that many. So what we can do in our neighborhood, tell them about it. What we learned here today, and so what we want is for the future of the trees. It's not just the trees standing there. They've got a big impact on our health system. So maybe we need that information should uh, pass in our neighborhood, friends, or whatever we can do. But what people don't know about that. That's my experience. Thank you. Sure, I'll set. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>